Hi guys. So today we are going to talk about chapter 19, which is population and community ecology. For my majors, it is going to be chapter 45. So demography is the statistical study of populations. So it is the way that we gather information for different things like how much of a population is in a rural area versus an urban area, what areas are more populated, the pattern of population, our life expectancy, things like that. This is actually part of my area of expertise. I am technically a behavioral evolutionary ecologist, so I have studied this. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. So the first thing that you need to understand is that populations are always changing, so they're dynamic. They're going to be affected by a lot of different things. Seasons, for example, are going to impact populations. Some people will vacation in certain areas and avoid other areas. They will have winter homes or summer homes, and that's going to impact populations in those particular areas. Natural disasters are going to displace people and impact not only the area that the natural disaster happened in, but all of the areas that the people go to to escape that natural disaster. And then, of course, there's competition for resources. Keep in mind, we're not only talking about humans here, we're talking about all types of populations. So populations are gonna be characterized by a few different things. Population size, of course, is one of the main ones, which is just the total number of individuals in a particular area at a particular time. And then population density is the number of individuals per unit area. So that's basically how close together people are. Species can be distributed in a variety of ways as well. So their distribution pattern is just how they are distributed in their particular habitat at any particular point in time. Now there's three different ways that individuals can be distributed within a population. Random is the first way, and as it sounds, they're just randomly all over the place. You're gonna find this with a lot of trees and plants who have wind-blown seeds because when their seeds are blown by the wind, they just kind of randomly land and germinate. They can be clumped in groups. So if you've heard of schools of fish or they travel in packs or herds, something like that. And then there's uniform where they're equally spaced apart. Penguins are have a uniform distribution to the point that if one penguin gets too close to another penguin, they'll actually hit them to space them out further. Life tables provide information about the life history of organisms. So this is the life expectancy of individuals and their mortality rate. There are a few different curves that have been formed from studying life tables. So survivorship curves actually graph the number of individuals that survive at each age versus time. So basically what this does is it allows us to compare different populations and how they survive. So there's three different types. Type one, there is mortality low in the early ages, and then in the middle years, it's still pretty low. So basically most individuals die at older ages. They produce few offspring, but they provide excellent care for their offspring. As you can imagine, humans have a type one survivorship curve. Then you have type two, where mortality is relatively constant throughout their entire lifespan. Rodents often have this type of survivorship curve. And then you have type three, where the early ages actually have the highest mortality. So there aren't a lot of organisms that actually make it to older age. They produce a large number of offspring so that they can have the best chance of reproducing and they do not give their offspring very much care at all. Basically, it's producing the most offspring with the least amount of care for the highest efficiency for them because they're not going to be around for very long to reproduce. So they have to get as many reproduce, they have to reproduce as many offspring as possible as early as possible. So here they are, you can see the type one on the top, that is humans. So you have 
very little mortality in the early ages. And then as we get older, that's when most humans pass away. Type two, as I said, rodents, birds are another example. It's just a straight on mortality, steadily decreasing over time. And then type three, where they have a high mortality rate early on in life and very few actually survive to live a longer life. How are populations regulated? Well, we know they have to be regulated to some extent because otherwise we would have an unlimited amount of species on the planet and the planet wouldn't be able to support it. So we have two types of growth. We have exponential growth and logistic growth. Exponential growth is a J-shaped curve. Basically, you have an accelerating population size, there are abundant natural resources, so the population can grow very rapidly. The problem is that this can only continue if unlimited sources are available all of the time. Well, we know that's not going to happen. At some point, something's going to run out. But this is a very good way to repopulate endangered species. There was a species of elephants that was endangered, and so a zoo basically gave them unlimited resources to expand their population and repopulate the species. And it worked. And eventually we know that sources are gonna run out at some point in time, so the population will level off. And that is where the logistic growth comes in. The logistic growth is a sigmoid or S-shaped curve. So what happens is resources are limited. So there's a competition for these resources. So exponential growth initially occurs at the beginning. However, the growth rate levels off because as more individuals are being added to the population, resources are being depleted. So there's what's called a carrying capacity. And you can see that red dotted line going across the top. The carrying capacity is basically the maximum population that any particular habitat can sustain. So as soon as the population hits that carrying capacity, it's going to level off because there aren't enough resources to support any more individuals. So population growth is also regulated by density dependent factors and density independent factors. So resources, of course, are gonna be a big thing that regulates population. If there aren't unlimited resources, at some point, competition is going to be crazy for those resources, and resources are going to start to deplete. Density-dependent factors are factors where the density of the population is going to affect their growth and mortality. So if they're closer together, that's going to hurt them versus if they're further apart. So these are factors that are normally biological in nature. For example, parasites and disease. If a population has a lot of people in a small area, diseases are gonna spread a lot faster in that particular area, and that's going to wipe out the population. Predation, if organisms are close together, it's a lot easier to prey on them. And then inter and intraspecific competition, which is competition between species and competition within a species that's going to be impacted if all of the organisms are super close together. We also have density independent factors though. These are factors that are gonna cause mortality regardless of the population density. So it doesn't matter if you've got a thousand people in this little area or five people in this little area. These are things that are going to harm them regardless. So these are normally physical in nature. So weather, natural disasters, pollution, it doesn't matter how many people are in an area. If an area has a wildfire, that area is gonna be impacted and the populations are gonna be impacted regardless on if there's a thousand individuals or a hundred, doesn't matter. Precipitation, tornadoes, things like that. So density dependent factors are going to impact the population even more if the individuals are close together. Density independent factors, it's going to impact the population regardless of the density. It doesn't matter how close the people are together or the organisms are together. We also have two types of species. 
case selected species and R selected species. Case selected species are going to be adapted to very stable, predictable environments. They usually have populations that are very close to their carrying capacity. They have large but fewer offspring and give large amounts of resources to those offspring to make sure that the offspring are successful and survive. Humans would be an example of case selected species. Our selected species, on the other hand, are pretty much the exact opposite. They're adapted to unstable and unpredictable environments. They have a large number of small offspring, so they can get as many offspring out there as possible because they know that not all of them are going to survive. So the more offspring that are out there, the more chances they have to have offspring survive. They don't provide a lot of resources or parental care to their offspring. It's like, here you go, put them out there and they're on their own kind of thing. Now, there's a few definitions that you guys have to be familiar with. Species, in order to be considered the same species, they have to be able to interbreed and produce fertile, viable offspring. That is crucial, fertile, viable offspring. I'm going to tell you why. Horses and donkeys are considered different species. However, they can interbreed. They create mules, but mules are sterile. So they can't, mules cannot produce other mules. So that is why donkeys and horses are separate species. Their offspring are not fertile. A population are members of the same species occupying the same area at a given time. A society is a population that shows cooperative behavior. So cooperation is really the key to having a society. Community are populations of species interacting. An ecosystem is the community, including its environment. So it's both the biotic, which are living, and the abiotic, which are non-living factors. So it's all of the species that live there and including precipitation, soil, rocks, wind, things like that. And then ecology is the study of interactions of the organisms with each other and their environment. So ecology really studies the relationships of organisms all over the place with each other, but also with their environment. That's very important as well. So I usually tell my class, a population would be all of us in the classroom. But as soon as you walk outside, now we're in a community because you have grass, squirrels, trees, a bunch of other bugs and species all interacting as soon as we walk outside. Now, if we were in a classroom and we were doing a group activity, let's say, that would be a cooperative behavior. So we would be technically a society at that point. So studying organisms in their environment obviously starts with the organism. Organisms will get together and form populations. Populations get together and form communities. And then when you put in all the abiotic non-living factors like precipitation, weather, wind, rock, soil, now you have an ecosystem. Diversity, we have to know how diverse a habitat is. Diversity is good. Increased diversity means increased success. There are two parts to diversity. Species richness, which is the number of different species that we have, and species abundance, which is how spread out they are. So the population evenness, so to speak. So let's say we have four different types of trees. Well, that's species richness. We have four different species. Now, if we have 25% of the population is each tree, that would be the relative abundance. So 25% of each tree. The habitat is where an organism lives within the community. So your habitat is like your address. It's like where you live, your house. In nature, they can be aquatic in the water, marine, salt water, arboreal in the trees, terrestrial on land. Now your niche is different. Your niche is the role an organism plays within the community. So a niche is like your job. Okay, so your habitat is where you live, that's your address, and your niche is your job. So a concept that you guys need to understand is that there's going to be competition for resources all of the time. This means we're going to have predator-prey interactions. Predators are going to be hunting their prey. We also have symbiotic relationships within the community 
that are going to affect the structure of the community. So first off, competition. Competition is basically just rivalry because of limited resources. You're going to always have competition for resources because there are never going to be unlimited resources. Our planet has a carrying capacity. We're just not really sure what it is yet. At some point in time, our planet's going to run out of resources, which is why there is renewed interest in sustainable resources. We have two types of competition, intraspecific and interspecific. Intra means within. So we're talking about competition within the same species. Inter means between. So we're talking about competition between different species. So we're always gonna be competing for food, space, light, water, shelter, basically everything we need. One solution to avoid competition is to move. You migrate out of the area, you go somewhere else but there's probably going to be competition wherever you move to. So this is just showing you some examples. You have the top picture there, they're competing within the same species. The side picture with the zebras, they're competition between species. And then you have predator-prey interactions, of course. So in the natural habitat, there's going to be something called partitioning of resources. Partitioning of resources actually reduces interspecific competition and generates what's called niche specialization. Niche specialization just means that certain organisms become really good at what they do. So it's like if you're working your job for so many years and you get specialized training, so you become really good at it. That's niche specialization. So partitioning of resources basically just means that different organisms are going to use different areas of the particular resource. So if we're talking about a habitat of trees, let's say, one species of lizard might use the top of the trees, another species might use the middle of the trees, and still another species might use the bottom. So now they're partitioned off and they're not directly competing with each other. So they're partitioned. This is going to prevent intense competition and it's gonna allow species to coexist. They can now live in the same tree because they are living in different parts of the tree. Predation is when a predator feeds on a prey. How efficient predators are is gonna be related to a few things. First off, the amount of prey available. If there's just an abundance of prey available, it doesn't really matter how good the predator is. They could basically trip over a rabbit and get it. They're gonna be eating. But it also depends on how well the predators are adapted to capture the prey. So as the population of prey decreases, the amount of predation decreases because as the population of prey is going down, the amount of predators seeking that prey is going to go down because there's just not enough prey to go around. As the population of prey increases, the amount of predation is going to increase because now there's more prey to hunt, so there's going to be more hunters to hunt. However, that's going to only go to a point. Once the maximum potential to capture prey is, really, is reached, there is not going to be an increase in predation. So it's going to level off, basically you only have so many predators that are going to be eating. Once they're full, they're not gonna keep eating just to keep eating. So as the prey increases, predation will increase until that maximum potential is reached and then it's gonna level off. There's also what we call the predator-prey cycle. The population of predators and prey is cyclic. The predator population is always going to be smaller than the prey population, but they're going to cycle together. So when the amount of prey increases, the amount of predators are going to increase because now there's more prey to feed them. However, because the amount of predators increased, now the amount of prey is going to decrease. Because there's fewer prey available, the number of predators is going to go down. Well, now that's gonna give the prey population a chance to rebound and come back up and increase. Well, when the prey population increases, the predator population is gonna increase because there's more prey available. And it just cycles together. 
So here you can see the predator prey cycle. The prey population is higher than the predator population and it's cyclic off a little bit. They don't cycle exactly together because again, reproduction takes time. So the prey population will increase once it hits its maximum, the predator population is going to start to increase. Then because the predator increases, the prey is going to decrease because now there's more predators eating them. The snowshoe hare and the lynx are a predator and a prey that happen to cycle. It's about once every 10 years or so. And I like to think that little hare gets away in my head. There is a balance between the predator prey populations and humans of course impact it. We have an impact on just about everything. Now there's a natural check and balance system that we just saw. However, hunting and trapping affect the system if we do not keep it in check. Hunters have hunting seasons that they're supposed to stick to. There's maximums and minimums that they can have. So, well not minimums, but maximums that they can catch. So as long as they stick to that, we're usually okay. However, there are certain situations where they may be hunting and they're not supposed to be, or they're not intentionally hunting. Let's say they're killing off the coyotes that are killing their cattle. Well, unfortunately, coyotes also eat mice, rabbits, and prairie dogs. So you kill the coyotes, now the rodent population is gonna increase. Rodents eat grass. So the rodents are then going to eat the grass that was used for the cattle. So when you're killing the coyotes to initially save the cattle, you're actually going to hurt the cattle anyway because the rodent population will eat their grass and now you're not gonna have anything to feed the cattle. So it's a vicious cycle that needs to be kept in check. So predators are gonna be adapted to catching prey and prey actually adapt to avoid being preyed upon. There are different strategies that are used and usually they try to, not try, but they usually end up keeping up with each other. It's an endless race. We call it the Red Queen hypothesis in ecology. The Red Queen hypothesis is basically they're co-evolving together Predators get better at catching prey, just as well as prey get better at avoiding being captured. Plants even have defense mechanisms. They have poisonous chemicals and things like needles and thrones that are physical that will actually hurt the herbivores preying upon them. Animals have a few different anti-predatory defense mechanisms. Camouflage or concealment, they hide. They blend in with their background. Walking sticks look like twigs angler fish on the ocean bottom. Moss look like bark. They have warning coloration, which are usually bright colors that is, are associated with being poisonous. If animals see a bright color, they usually tend to avoid that color. Poison arrow frogs and lionfish, for example. Fright, they will confuse or startle the predator. So a porcupine has long quills. A puffer fish will puff up. And then vigilance, safety in numbers. That's why birds will travel in flocks, fish in schools, mammals in herds. So predation is basically what drives evolution. So predator adaptations to locate and subdue the prey, prey adaptations to elude and defend themselves. So horns will defend themselves. They're fast, they'll have warning coloration, spines, thorns, toxins. These are all things that they will adapt and evolve over time to defend themselves. So predation is basically going to provide a strong selection pressure on both the predator and the prey because the predator has to keep up with the prey's adaptation, so to speak, and vice versa. If the predators get too good at catching their prey, they're going to run out of prey. If prey get too good at eluding the predators, the predators are going to die out. So they co-evolve together. Other defense mechanisms, camouflage, we have cryptic coloration. The whippoorwill up top there, the lizard, the toad, the other lizard, they're all blending in with their background, so they're very difficult to see. Then we have something called mimicry. Mimicry happens when one resembles another that actually possesses an anti-predator defense mechanism. There's two types, there's Batesian and Mullerian, and you have to know the difference between the two. 
Batesian is when one looks like another organism that actually possesses a defense mechanism. So it's when a harmless one looks like a harmful one. So a fly and a bee, for example, or a viceroy and monarch butterflies. So something that is harmless is going to look like a harmful one. Mullerian is when they look alike and possess the same defense mechanism. So numbers kind of thing. Black and yellow striped bugs, for example. Most of them produce stingers. So bumblebees and yellow jackets. Queen butterflies and monarch butterflies. So they have the same defense mechanism. They look alike. So predators are going to tend to just avoid them entirely. If you see a yellow and black striped insect, you're probably not going to stick around to find out what kind it is. You're just going to avoid it entirely. So if you compare a king snake to a coral snake, that's Batesian mimicry. As the saying goes, red next to yellow will kill a fellow, red next to black, venom black. Here we have Batesian mimicry where the palatable or harmless species mimics the harmful one. You have a hawk moth larvae right there mimicking a green parrot snake. The hawk moth larvae is harmless. The green parrot snake is harmful. So the hawk moth larvae will kind of puff up to look like the green parrot snake and mimic it. Another example of Batesian mimicry, the monarch butterfly and the viceroy butterfly. Monarchs are pale or poisonous, sorry. Viceroys are edible, but they kind of look alike to where they can avoid predation. So which one is the fly? Which one is the bee? Which is the moth? Which is the bee? And again, we have conversion evolution happening. Mullary mimicry, safety in numbers, black and yellow striped insects, pretty much all look alike, so they can avoid predation. Warning coloration, it's also called aposematic coloration. Aposematic species come to resemble each other. There's going to be bright colors, oranges, blacks, yellows, whites, that are associated with poisonous species. So what kind of mimicry is this? It is Batesian. Coral snake is poisonous, the king snake is not. Now they're saying red on yellow poison fellow, red on black safe from attack. Now the theory of competitive exclusion basically states that no two similar species can occupy the same niche at the same time. So tigers and lions, for example, they are too similar. Their competition would basically cause both of them to go extinct. So lions and tigers do not live in the same area because they can't. They would kill each other. Make sure you know the theory of competitive exclusion for your test. Behavior. Behavior is a response to an environmental stimulus. And a stimulus is something that initiates a response in the form of a behavior. Categorically speaking, we have two types of behavior. Innate behavior that we are born with. It is genetically pre-programmed, it is automatic, it is stereotypic. Learned behavior, on the other hand, is brought about due to experience. It is adaptive. It involves changes of pre-existing behavior. So as we learn behaviors, our behaviors will change. Got the old nature versus nurture controversy. Nature are your genes, so that is innate, that's what you're born with versus nurture, which is your environment, which is learned, which one has more effect on our behavior? Well, the correct answer is they have an equal impact on our behavior. Nature, which is what we are born with, and nurture both impact our behavior. The whole point of behavior is to survive. Basic behaviors are associated with survival, especially when we're talking about obtaining resources. So food, shelter, mates, of course. There's also ones that aid in avoiding predators. So fight or flight mechanism, for example. Behaviors are gonna be naturally selected because if the behavior leads to success in reproduction, 
those behaviors are going to be passed on. If it's not, it's not. So some concepts you need to be familiar with. Behaviors do have a genetic basis, so they are inheritable, but they are also environmentally influenced. Animals with the behaviors that help them meet their basic needs for survival the best are naturally selected to produce offspring because they're going to be successful at producing offspring. So if they're successful at producing offspring, their genes are going to be passed on to the next generation. So survival of the fittest, I'm sure we've all heard of that, but it's really survival of the fittest in that particular area because what is successful in one area isn't necessarily going to be successful in another area, okay? Fitness may be measured by the number of offspring produced by an animal. The most fit is going to produce the most offspring. Animals that have unproductive behaviors are typically not going to survive. They're not going to reproduce. They're not going to contribute to the gene pool because they're not going to pass on their genes. Externally speaking, there can be factors that motivate and influence behaviors. For example, if you have to avoid a predator or acquire food or get a mate. Now, a behaviorist is also, also called an ethologist. They attempt to determine two things. How an animal is organized and equipped to carry out a behavior and how that behavior aids in the animal's survival. So we know there are two systems that influence behavior the nervous system and the endocrine system. The nervous system produces a very quick response using electrical impulses and nerve impulses. The endocrine system is slower to respond. It produces hormones or chemical messengers, but its effects last longer. So this is gonna promote an internal readiness for behaviors such as mating and migration. So the complexity of behaviors is gonna vary. Does it vary with the level of central nervous system development? Does it matter if there's an endocrine system? Yes. So innate behaviors are predominantly influenced by our genes. They are inborn, they're automatic, they're stereotypic. So the question is, which is more apt to respond using innate behaviors, vertebrates or invertebrates? Well, as you see, it's invertebrates. But then the question becomes why? Their nervous system is not as well developed as vertebrates, and they have limited ability to process that external stimuli to react with more complex behaviors. Basically, they can't really learn more complex behaviors, so they have to go with the innate behaviors that they're genetically pre-programmed with. They usually also have a shorter lifespan. They do not take care of their young, so there really isn't a need to learn behaviors. There are some advantages though. There's no period of learning. Every time is accurately performed, first time and every time after that. Fixed action patterns are initiated by a sign stimulus. Once it's initiated by the sign stimulus, it's gonna to go to completion. So a fixed action pattern is a behavior that occurs that an organism is going to do in response to a particular stimulus. It's always gonna happen regardless if the stimulus is taken away or not, every single time. There are modifications of fixed action patterns that occur, and this is called learning. With the improvement of motor skills and as we get higher up in the vertebrate organisms, this happens. Now there's two videos here. One is a stickleback fish. Basically what happens is the stickleback fish, their, the sign stimulus is a red belly. As soon as the stickleback fish sees the red belly, it attacks. It doesn't matter what the shape is. So they do an experiment where they have different shapes and they have red bottoms and then they have something that looks just like a stickleback fish, except there's not a red bottom and the stickleback fish will attack whatever shape it is with the red bottom every time. It will not attack the thing that looks just like a stickleback fish that doesn't have a red bottom because it's missing that sign stimulus, which is the red bottom. When they were doing an experiment once, it actually, the stickleback fish, the fish tank was in a window, 
and a red bus drove by and the stickleback fish tried to attack the red bus. The red is that sign stimulus. And once they see it, they will attack. If they don't see the red, no attack. The other one is a goose that rolls its egg. Whenever an egg is taken out from underneath a goose, it will roll it back in. So in the experiment, as the goose is rolling the egg back in, they move the egg. Well, the goose keeps rolling the egg back in because that's what a fixed action pattern is. It will be continued out until completion. And I want you guys to watch those. This is just showing you the stickleback fish, the male stickleback. If it sees the red, it's gonna attack because it knows it's a male stickleback and it's attacked. It's protecting its territory. Female sticklebacks, however, don't have a red belly. So if they see a female stickleback, they won't attack it. They would rather court it, of course. A reflex is a rapid involuntary response to a stimulus. The nervous system, we have sensory receptors and sensory neurons that are gonna carry information into the central nervous system. Then the central nervous system is gonna send out a response using motor neurons to produce a movement. So the input is the stimulus, the output is the response. So blinking, hiccuping, sneezing, things like that. So let's say we get pepper up our nose. We're gonna sneeze to try to get it out. That's a reflex, okay? Instincts are similar to reflexes, but are more valuable in helping them adapt to their surroundings. Lovebirds nesting, snakes and snails, for example, they have these instincts. Now these two videos, I please watch them. The one is a freezing frog. Basically, the frog has something that is similar to antifreeze in its circulatory system. So when it gets cold, it will basically freeze up. And then it will stay like that until it warms up. Please watch it, it's very interesting. The other one is the fainting goats. The goats basically faint if they're startled. And that's kind of hilarious, so please watch it. Then we have what's called orientation or taxis. This is just a response toward or away from a stimulus. Phototaxis is a response to light. Chemotaxis is a response to chemicals. So phototaxis, moths have positive phototaxis because they will fly towards light. Cockroaches have negative phototaxis because they scatter when you turn the lights on. Chemotaxis is used to attract mates or to mark territories. So if you're trying to attract a mate, that's gonna be positive chemotaxis. If you're trying to mark territory, that's negative chemotaxis. Ants will follow trails, for example. Cats will mark their territory. Males in general will mark their territories. And then there's also the sun and star navigation and seasonal migrations that bird you, birds use. Then we have learned behaviors. These are behaviors that are modified because of life experiences. Vertebrates demonstrate these learned behaviors. Basically what they are are the pre-programmed behaviors that are modified. Because we have a longer lifespan and there's that period of maternal nurturing, so learning can actually occur. So modified action potentials, an example would be a chick pecking the parent's bill. When the chick is initially born and pecks the parent's bill for food, it's not very accurate. But within a couple of days, their motor skills and visual experience improve and their pecking gets more accurate. Imprinting and song learning, there's a, what we call a sensitive period, which is a period that learning can occur. Associated with imprinting are Conrad Lorenz, he is very famous for doing his experiment with goslings. Basically what happens is when goslings hatch, they imprint on the first thing they see, which is usually their parents, and they will follow their parents around and that's how they learn everything. Well, what Conrad did was he had him be the first thing that a group of goslings saw. So they followed him around and did everything, and he ended up having to teach them. He built this little contraption to teach them how to fly. 
he's a really old guy. And in my ethology class, we actually watched a movie with him showing his techniques. And the one part was him walking through the forest and the goslings were following behind him. And then he was going to get into the water to teach them how to swim. And so he gets up there and he starts taking off his clothes and we're all like, oh my God. And luckily it cut to him in the water because like I said, he was really old. Anyway, filial imprinting is when the offspring recognize their parents. Sexual imprinting is when young learn to recognize what they want in a mate. Song learning is when songbirds develop their particular species specific song. They learn it from older adults. And this also occurs during the sensitive period. Now we have two types of associative learning. Associative learning is a change in behavior that involves connecting two events. Extinction of this behavior can occur. Unlike imprinting, on imprinting that learned behavior is sustained, but with associative learning, extinction can occur, it can die out basically. So classical conditioning and operant conditioning are the two types. Classical conditioning is associated with Pavlov. We've probably all heard of Pavlov's dog at some point in time. But basically what happens is the individual is conditioned to respond to some irrelevant stimulus. So what Pavlov did was he measured the dog's salivation when he was going to be fed. Then he started ringing a bell every time that the dog was fed. So the dog learned to associate ringing of the bell with being fed and started to salivate when the bell rang. So that irrelevant stimulus, which was the ringing of the bell, became a conditioned response with the dog salivating when the bell rang. We also use ads, we use sex appeal basically to sell products like that Axe commercial where the dude sprayed Axe on himself and women were just tearing their clothes off to get to him, that kind of thing. There's a clip on classical conditioning that I want you to watch. Um, it was, there was also a clip, I'm not sure if this is it or not, but with The Office, with Jim, he would, every time his computer windows would ding, he would offer Dwight a mint, and then Dwight basically started associating the mint with the ringing of the computer. So the next time the computer rang, Jim didn't give him a mint, and Dwight like held his hand out waiting for the mint. And Jim was like, what do you want? And he's like, I don't know. All of a sudden, my mouth is kind of dry. I want a mint. Classical conditioning. Operant conditioning, on the other hand, is associated with Skinner. Skinner used what was called the Skinner box with rats. And he would shock them. And basically, operant conditioning is associated with reinforcements and punishments. So the stimulus response connection is going to be strengthened using rewards and it's going to be decreased using punishments. Trial and error learning is also a part of this. So when you teach animals tricks, you give them rewards. So they do the trick. Now the video with this is from the Big Bang Theory and Sheldon using operant conditioning to try to train Penny to be the girlfriend that he wanted for Leonard. So every time she does something that Sheldon thinks is appropriate, he offers her a chocolate. And then when Leonard starts to question him about it, he squirts him in the face and says, bad Leonard. So watch the videos. They're kind of funny. Habituation is when we lose a response to a stimulus. So this is the cry wolf effect. You have a decrease in response to repeated occurrences of the stimulus. Sometimes when your alarm goes off, you hit snooze and you don't even know you hit it because you're becoming habituated to it called the cry wolf effect because of the boy who cried wolf. The boy thought it was funny to cry wolf so all the villagers would come and save him and the wolf wasn't really there but then when the wolf actually came the boy cried wolf and nobody came because they thought it was another joke. But what it does is it enables animals to disregard unimportant stimuli. So things that aren't important we can kind of block out. So, for example, it's one reason why if a parent is sleeping, they can wake up when they hear their child crying. That's an important stimulus. 
falling leaves do not trigger fear in baby birds because if it did, they'd all fall out of the nest. We talked about the society earlier. It's a group of individuals that is organized in a cooperative manner. Now, some animals are actually social and live in groups while others are solitary and only join with the opposite sex to reproduce. There are adapting, adaptive mating behaviors like female choice and male competition. And we have pros and cons of group living. It's more protection from predators. They can work together to find food and they can divide up the labor. But there's bad things like an increased competition for the resources they have, diseases spread easier, and increased aggression towards group members. So imagine yourself living in a house with 10 other people. It would be great because you're never alone. Like if somebody breaks into the house, safety in numbers kind of thing. You can take turns buying groceries. So you only have to buy groceries once every 10 weeks. And you can split up the cleaning. So you only have to clean the kitchen once every 10 weeks or whatever. But imagine living with 10 people in the same house. You have an increased competition for those limited resources. So imagine the day before grocery shopping day. Now there's 10 of you fighting for whatever's left. If one person gets a cold, everybody's getting that cold. And they would probably get on your nerves to some extent. So sociobiology studies these behaviors and interactions between group members. So social interactions and constructs. Now, on your portfolios, it says social interactions and constructs, and there's four dots. This is the first one, ritualizations. Examples of ritualizations are displays of aggression and displays of mating rituals. So displays of aggression are conflicts over limited resources. They can be resolved without bloodshed usually, and they just act out of aggression, but they don't fight to the death. It usually ends when one of them gives up and becomes a subordinate. We also have courtships and mating rituals. These are signals used to prepare the sexes for mating. Females usually will make the choice of mating because they have limited egg production. Now, this is what I mentioned earlier with female choice and male-to-male -male competition. Female choice occurs because they have limited egg production. So they will choose a mate based on whatever characteristic it is. So for peacocks and peahens, for example, the peahen is not ornamented. She is very plain and very drab. The peacock has the nice showy tail and is all colorful and actually makes it wave. So a peahen will choose a peacock based on the showiness of the tail and the colorfulness. Because the more colorful it is and the more showy it is, the more healthy they deem that individual to be. Females in this situation are usually not ornamented and males are very ornamented. Watch the clip on the birds of paradise, please, because it is awesome. And you'll see how all the males are very ornamented and the females are pretty plain. The other type of sexual selection is male to male competition. It's important to the reproductive success of the individual because they have to win the competition to be able to reproduce. Elephant seals, for example. Elephant seals are, there's an alpha male and a beta male. The alpha male is in charge and gets 95% of the matings. The beta male gets about 4% of the matings and then the rest of the males get that 1%. But the alpha male has to take care of the harem. He's in charge of the whole group. He has to protect the group, feed the group, everything. So he has a lot of responsibilities. So what ends up happening is strategies develop for those other males to get matings. They will wait until the alpha male has had multiple fights and they're tired and then they'll challenge him. Or they'll wait out on the beach and then run in, mate and run out. Or they'll even act like they're females to get mates. The problem is that the alpha male is going to be the one that is the strongest and has the most endurance. And those are going to be the genes that are passed on in the group for the most part. And even if somebody challenges the alpha male later on, they're not going to stay in charge for long because they're not the strongest in the group. 
So make sure you watch those two videos as well. And watch them, you have to be in slideshow mode. This is the second one of the social constructs, dominance hierarchies. These are pecking orders. The higher ranking alpha is gonna be the strongest and more fit. They have better access to the resources, so they eat first. But as I said, they have to protect the harem. You're gonna have reduced aggression between group members until the balance of power starts to shift. Then you might have more aggression occurring. The third one is territoriality. This is when you have to defend your area from other individuals. It reduces aggression between group members because everybody has their own territory. However, individuals with better territories usually get better mates. So this is gonna improve their chances for mating and reproduction. The last one is altruism. This is self-sacrificing behavior. You put yourself at risk to protect everybody else. Alarm calls is an example. Alarm calls occur when somebody on the stays on the outer border of the territory watching for predators. And when they see a predator, they let out a call. What that's going to do is let the rest of the group know there's a predator coming and they need to run, but it puts that animal at risk because they're right there by the predator and they're probably going to be the first one to get killed. Meerkats do this. It's a beneficial behavior if the group shares common genes, but can reproduce the reproductive success of that individual. But it's going to be beneficial to them, even if it reproduces their own reproductive success, if they're related to the members of the group. So usually you're going to see this between members of the group that are related. There are also different ways that these societies communicate. Communication basically involves a sender sending a message and then a receiver getting the message and responding. There are different modes of communication. Chemical in the form of pheromones. These are chemical messages passed between members of the same species. The message is gonna be picked up by the receptors. The advantage is it works both during the day and the night and it can work over long distances. So marking territories, for example, um, when you send out a chemical pheromone to attract a mate, the female lion is going to lure the male by spreading her sex pheromones, but also by certain movements and postures she makes. Female mosquitoes use carbon dioxide concentrations to actually locate their victims. So the more carbon dioxide you give off, the more likely you're going to be bitten by mosquitoes. Then we have auditory communication. These are vocalizations that are used in like mating calls, distress signals, but also marking your territory. The advantages are it's faster than chemical communication because sound travels faster. It works at the day and the night. And the great thing is you can modify the pattern intensity and frequency to dictate what is going on. So certain patterns can mean danger. Certain patterns can mean food. Intensities can mean how far the predator is away, things like that. Then we have visual. These are useful in observing rituals or aggression and courtship. Disadvantage is it only works really during the day and they have to be close enough to see you. But those are pictures of the birds of paradise. So make sure you watch that video. Finally, we have tactile. These use touch sensations. So grooming, feeding their chicks. The biggest advantage is it helps them form bonds between each other. The disadvantage is of course, you have to be in close proximity. Symbiosis. These are close relationships between two different species. We have three different types that we're gonna talk about. Commensalism is when one species benefits and the other species is neither harmed nor benefited. So the other species is unaffected. Now, sometimes these are difficult to show because you really can't be sure if the one species is unaffected. Epiphytes on the tops of trees and barnacles on whales are examples. The epiphytes live on the tops of the trees so that they can have access to the sun and photosynthesize themselves. But again, 
how much harm or good is that tree that the epiphyte is living on the top of undergoing? We're not sure. Barnacles on whales, same thing. Catalegrits are a bird and they live on the top of buffalo, water buffalo. And as the water buffalo graze, the catalegrits get the insects that fly up. Commensalistic? Well, we think so. But who really knows if the cattle grits sitting on top of the backs of the water buffalo today is irritating or not. Maybe it's hurting them and exposing them to diseases. You know, we're not really sure. So commensalistic relationships are kind of difficult sometimes to show. Then we have parasitism. This is when one species benefits and the host is harmed. We have different types of parasites. Endoparasites live inside of the host. Ectoparasites live outside of the host. And social parasites, one species uses the resource of another species. So endoparasites are like bacterial pathogens, protozoans, fungal pathogens, tapeworms, they live inside of the host. Ectoparasites like leeches and ticks just attach to the outside of the host and suck the blood out. Social parasites are like the cuckoo bird. Basically what the cuckoo bird does is it lays its eggs in the nest of another species and then that bird raises their babies. The cuckoo eggs are larger than the species they pick and the cuckoo baby is larger than the other birds. So what will end up happening is the cuckoo bird, once it hatches, it actually starts kicking the other birds out of the nest. So here you have a picture, and there's the cuckoo bird pushing the other egg out of the nest, and there's the other species feeding the giant cuckoo bird has now taken over the entire nest. The last type is mutualism. This is when both species benefit. So food, home is provided in exchange for something. Now mycorrhizae on the bottom of plant roots we have talked about so many times. Mycorrhizae are fungus that live in the plant roots, and basically what happens is the mycorrhizae give the plants more surface area to be more effective, and in return, the plants make food for the mycorrhizae. There's some intestinal bacteria that help with digestion, and in the return, they get a home. Trypanosomes in the guts of termites, for example. You got sea anemones and clownfish. Lichen. We've talked about lichen so many times. Lichen is an algae or cyanobacteria and a fungus that live together. The algae or cyanobacteria is photosynthetic, so it makes food for the fungus. In return, the fungus gives the algae or cyanobacteria a home. So communities also have to develop. This is the last thing we're going to talk about. Ecological succession is the progressive change in the composition and diversity of communities over time after a particular disturbance. So basically it's the rebuilding of a community. The important thing is that it happens in a series of events. It starts with grasses and weeds, then shrubs, then trees. So we start with very low lying vegetation and build to high vegetation. Now we have two types, primary and secondary. Primary occurs when a community develops from no soil base. So basically after a volcanic eruption or if a glacier retreats, there's no soil whatsoever left. So what happens is lichens will come in and bacteria and they will build soil from the rocks. And then grasses and weeds will show up, shrubs and trees. Secondary succession occurs after a community has been disturbed, but we have soil in place. So if there was a fire or when the fields are plowed, there's still soil there. So you don't need to build the soil. So primary succession, you have to build the soil because there's nothing there. Secondary succession, you still have soil. So you can describe the community by how mature it is. Pioneer versus climax. Pioneer communities are developing communities. Climax communities are stable communities. So pioneers are the first communities established once secondary succession begins. So you'll have your pioneer species, which are gonna be your rugged species, and then shrubs will come in, and then finally trees will come in. 
Now the climax community is that stable community that's been established after all of those changes, ecological succession have occurred. This is the result. This is the long lived community. Now factors can affect what type of climax community is formed. How much rainfall there is, temperature, how much sunlight's available, what kind of soil there is. Those are all factors that are gonna impact what type of trees end up being there. The type of producers are also going to influence what kind of consumers we see in the Climax community. Because if we have grasslands, we're going to see a bunch of grazers. However, if we have trees, then we can see monkeys and birds and other organisms that live in the trees. So in a nutshell, a pioneer community, the environment is very harsh. It is the first community that's going to be established, and it is rebuilding from some sort of disturbance. Climax communities, the environment is favorable because it is the result of ecological succession. It is the established final community. Pioneer community has low species diversity because it's just the rugged species that initially start out and they slowly get added to over time. Climax community has high species diversity because there are, it's the result. There's a lot of species there. Pioneer community has low stability. Climax community is very stable. A pioneer community has increasing biomass because again, it is rebuilding from some sort of disturbance. A climax community has a stable biomass because that's the final end result of succession. Okay, so that is it. If you have any questions, I know it was a lot of information being thrown at you please reach out to me and let me know and I will answer them to the best of my ability. Hopefully this helps you all and we will talk soon. Bye.